I decided to give a presentation on Eve because a lot of women that I talked to were really intrigued by Eve, and I know I was myself. Um, I'll have to admit, though, that I had a lot of preconceived notions about Eve. Uh, she was kind of the original bad girl of the Bible, uh, and uh, the legacy she left was really one of sin and despair for all mankind, right? That's what most people associate when they think about Eve, and I thought, how is that going to relate to me? I mean, how is that something I can really learn from? But you know, what I discovered was that Eve really has two legacies, and those two legacies are this. She had a legacy of sin and despair. Her actions condemned the world, but as we'll see, she also had a legacy of salvation and hope because it was through her seed, Jesus Christ, that the world would be saved. And so she has two very important legacies. So what we're gonna do is look in detail at these two legacies and see how they apply to our lives today and help us determine the legacy that we want to leave. So to do that, we're gonna turn to the seven seeds of history, of biblical history, and that's something that we talk a lot about at Answers in Genesis at the Creation Museum, and they're really seven milestones throughout Scripture. And these are going to help us understand more about Eve. Now, Eve obviously is only present in bodily form in the first two seeds of creation and corruption. And we're going to spend the majority of our time focused on these because they're foundational to her legacies. But the remaining five seeds are also very important for Eve's legacy, and especially understanding that legacy of salvation and hope. So we're going to talk about all of these today. And we're going to begin with the very first C, which is creation. And we know uh, from Scripture that God created both man and woman, both Adam and Eve, on the sixth day of creation. After he created the land animals, he created Adam and Eve. And again, we know that from Scripture. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So it's very clear from Scripture that both Adam and Eve, both male and female, were made on the same day. And we go to um, Genesis 1, 28, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what we see in chapter one is basically a summary. You get a summary of, of what was created on each day. And then what chapter two of Genesis does, it sort of takes us back in time and it specifically talks a lot about the creation of Adam and Eve. It really focuses on that. And it's important that we know these details, um, both from a human perspective, because after all, this is our origin, but also from God's perspective, um, because we are the crowning glory of creation. We were the only ones created in God's image to have a relationship with him. And, you know, God, after he created, you know, man and woman, he said to them, you know, they'd be fruitful, they're to multiply, have lots of kids, right? They had the job of filling, the, <laughs> of helping to start fill the earth, uh, fill the earth and subdue it. They were to be stewards of everything that God had created. They were over all of it. They were the crowning glory of his creation. So the first part of chapter two really focuses on uh, the creation of Adam. But what we want to go to is mid-chapter when we learn about the creation of Eve. And Genesis 2.18 says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, this is a really important verse. Uh, this is the first time in all creation, this is before the curse, that God declares something not good. Now, not in the sense of being imperfect, okay? It was not imperfect, but in the sense of being incomplete, okay? It wasn't quite complete yet. There was still, there was something missing. And so God decides to make um, Eve, or the woman, um, as a helper comparable to Adam. Now, what does comparable mean? It means the same kind of being. She was to have the same image of God. She was to be the same intellectually and, um, and uh, spiritually. You know, she was the same kind of being. So she was a counterpart to Adam. She was equal with Adam, but she had a different role than Adam. And that is important to understand. That was right there in God's original design, that although Adam and 
Eve were equal, though man and woman and equal, husband and wife, they have different roles. Um, Adam was the leader and Eve was the helper. Adam was created first. And there are many other instances throughout Genesis and scripture, which we'll talk about some of those, where it makes clear that the husband's role is to be leader in the family and that the wife's role is to be the helper. And so this was in place before the fall, before the curse. This was not a result of the curse. And that's important to remember. Okay? We're going to come back to this issue again. This was God's original design and plan. It was affected by the curse. And we all know that. <laughs> all married couples sitting here know that. Um, it was affected as a result of the curse, okay? Very importantly affected, and we're gonna talk about that. And you know, some people, you know, the, the problem is the feminist movement has really infiltrated the church, and it's made women feel that if they are a helper, they are somehow inferior. But again, God's word makes it clear. Just as the Trinity has three different parts to it, they're all equal. They have three different roles, but they're all one. Just as Adam and Eve, although they're, they're one in marriage, um, you know, they're equal, they're different. I mean, they have different roles, and so that's okay. So God decided, first of all, to bring the animals to Adam to name, because that's actually what happens next, before we get to the creation of Eve. And you might think, okay, why did God do this? So Adam basically concludes at the end of this, but for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. So he's naming all these animals. He just didn't find anyone like him. And I really think it was that God helping to show Adam there's nobody else like you. And what I'm gonna do is create somebody, a counterpart to you. You can't find anyone like this in all of creation. I haven't made her yet. It's not like, you know, God was trying to find a helper, okay? He knew there wasn't one. He already decided he was gonna make one, but he needed Adam to realize that too. He wanted him to learn that he did not yet have any counterpart on earth. Adam had to discover his uniqueness as a human being. God was preparing Adam for the big moment when Eve would be brought to him. Adam had to understand that he and Eve would stand together in a circle of creation nothing else in the world could occupy. Created in God's image, only they could enjoy fellowship with one another and with their created. They were the crowning glory of creation. So next we have the creation of Eve. And the Lord Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought it to the man. And I think it's really interesting what God uses to make the woman from. He, makes, he takes her and makes her from a rib. And uh, Matthew Henry, who's a, an older um, commentator on uh, scripture, I, I just love what he says about this because it's just so perfect and so fitting. Not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. And I really like the way he says that. It's taken from his side, again, as a sign of equality, a counterpart, Equal, but different, okay? Different roles within the marriage relationship. Now, but I have to say, my all-time favorite quote on this comes from John MacArthur, which many of you are probably familiar with. Adam was refined dirt. <laughs> Eve, Eve was a glorious refinement of humanity itself. So all you ladies, go home, tell your husband, you're refined dirt. Um, I'm refined humanity. So, <laughs> and, we, and we, you know, we laugh about that because I, when I read that, I just, I had to chuckle. I mean, that's just kind of a funny statement. But, you know, why does MacArthur say that? Because it's biblical. We have to go to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians eleven seven. 7. For man indeed ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. She is a refinement of humanity itself. And it's interesting here because a lot of people think Christianity oppresses women. Okay? We make women submissive, you know, it's very problematic. But MacArthur actually says, you know, what scripture shows us is that women are actually in some ways exalted above men because they are the living and breathing manifestation of the glory of a race made in God's image. So scripture clearly exalts women contrary to popular belief. It's not that we're above men, okay, women are not above men, they're equal to them, but we can kind of think of women as a further refinement of mankind itself. 
Now, it's really interesting, when I was preparing this talk, a lot of authors, and I read a lot of different books and things on Eve, a lot of people think that Eve was unsurpassingly beautiful, right? And I believe that she was, and she was perfect. <laughs> and so I believe she was very, very beautiful. But it's interesting because the Bible actually never gives us a description of what Eve looked like. But many people throughout the ages have tried to illustrate what they think Eve looked like. And I was kind of interested, because I know there's a lot of art out there on that. So I had my friend Dan Letha, um, who works as an illustrator and, and uh, cartoonist for Answers the Genesis, I said, can you find me some of these pictures out there? And so this is what he was able to find. Now, I don't know about you, but <laughs> this is not what I think of. <laughs> um, these people have a very different idea of it. Um, and some of these, Eve's having a very bad hair day. Um, in, in one of the lower, the lower pictures, she doesn't even look like she has a neck. Uh, I mean, this is just not what I'm thinking. And he found some more. Um, in some of these, she's very muscular, right? I wish I had, you know, boy, those muscles are really big. Looks like she's been working out. Uh, this lower one here looks like she could use some coffee that morning. I mean, it just doesn't, you know? She does, it's just not what I'm envisioning. And you notice, too, that all of these women are Caucasian. Okay? Not one of them probably really represents what Eve looked like. So how do we portray Eve at the Creation Museum? Now, that's really different. Um, she is very beautiful. I think the way we portray her, and I really like the way that we do that, probably closer to what she actually looked like because um, she's middle brown in skin color. She's middle brown pretty much in hair color and eye color, um, which is necessary to get all the different variations that we see today in skin color, eye color, hair color, things like that. So probably much more um, realistic portrayal of Eve. And one thing interesting that John MacArthur said was maybe the Bible doesn't describe her beauty because that's not what God was focusing on. That's not what God wants us to focus on. Um, her role um, was to be, you know, she had a duty to God and she was to be a helper for her husband. And that's what we need to be focusing on too. Not what's on the outside, but what's on the inside. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But what was Adam's response when he saw Eve? He said this, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. He realized that she was made, so she was the same as him in image. She was the same spiritually, the same intellectually. She was the same kind of being. She was equal, but she was different. And uh, I had a Bible professor that, you, that used to say, well, she was called woman because when Adam saw her, he said, whoa, man. <laughs> now, that's not in Scripture. Um, but, you know, I, there's no doubt from him saying what he says here that he was very much impressed with her. And, uh, and we have this statement, you know, obviously recorded for us in Genesis. So what happened next? Well, God institutes the very first marriage. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So marriage is instituted here. What was once one has been divided into two. Okay, you have Adam, then you have Adam and Eve. And then he reunites them in marriage as one. This is why marriage can only be defined as between one man and one woman. Because two men coming together and two men coming together doesn't do it. Okay? It does not reunite what God originally separated and put it back together again. Right? So that's important to remember. Now, imagine what their marriage was like. Complete and total perfection, joy and happiness. They were perfect human beings, and so they would have had a perfect marriage. Now, we know it didn't last, <laughs> and we're all living proof that it didn't last. Um, and those of us that are married today know it isn't perfect. And if you're going to be married, trust me, it's not perfect, okay? Because you're not perfect. Therefore, you're not going to have a perfect marriage. But that's all because of what happened next. And it's important to understand this because it's important to understand how we're affected in these relationships and how we need to work against that. We need to work against that curse. You know, some people ask me, how long did it take, how long do you think after creation Adam and Eve sinned? And I say, knowing mankind, not long. <laughs> um, I doubt it took very long at all. Now, the other reason I say that more you know, seriously is that Satan had to strike 
before Adam and Eve fulfilled God's command to be fruitful and multiply. Because MacArthur says it well, he wanted to sabotage all of humanity, okay, against God. And the only way to do that was to strike before they fulfilled God's command. So it probably wasn't very long. So what happened? Let's go back to the Garden of Eden and, and see this conversation that the serpent's going to have with Eve. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Hey, now it's interesting here too, why did Satan choose to approach Eve? Why didn't he approach Adam? Remember, she was equal with Adam. She had the same image, she's the same spiritually, she's the same intellectually, but yet he chose to approach her first. And some commentators have suggested the reason that Satan chose her was because it was like insulting God. He was going against God's created order of leadership in the family. So he approached the helper instead of the leader, which was kind of a slap in the face to God. Well, I'm gonna talk to the woman first. I'm not gonna talk to the leader of the family. So what does he do here, though? He questions God's word. Has God indeed said, and we've talked about that a lot so far here. Ken really emphasized that the other day. And... Um, then he goes on to misquote God. He says, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. That's not what God said. Right? Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. No, God said you can eat from every tree but one. That's what God said. But he clearly misquotes God here. And you know what? It hasn't changed. He's still doing this today. And... Um, and having devastating effects. You know, Satan turned what, was, what God has as a positive statement, you can eat of every tree except this one, into a very negative statement. He's changing it. He's implying that God is making severe limitations. He's really limiting you. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, and she's thinking, she knows what, what's really true. You can, only, you can eat from everything but one? I mean, come on, that's, that's really impeding you. That's really hurting you. So what, is, so what does the woman say? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. Now, it's interesting here because she's changing okay, what God actually said, just slightly, but she's changing it. Now, well, there's a kind of a caveat to this. We don't know if God gave her this command directly or it was given to her through Adam. Likely it was given to her through Adam because he was the leader, so he was the one that would be responsible for telling her God's words about what they were to do and not to do. Um, so it's possible that Adam changed God's words when he told her. We don't know that. I think that's kind of unlikely because there wouldn't have been any really reason for him to do that. But Eve is in this really interesting situation now. Okay? She's being confronted with the truthfulness of God's word, and she seems to back off of it, doesn't she? She kind of changes things a little bit. And she says, she actually takes away some adverbs here. God says you may freely eat of every tree. What does she say? well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. So they're kind of diminishing some of the positive aspect of it. And then she goes on to say, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So she's actually exaggerating the negative aspect of it. She says, we can't even touch it. Not only can't we eat of it, we can't touch it. And if we do, we'll die. Now, this is kind of a, a, a dealing with the Hebrew here. God says you will surely die. She says die. Surely die, if you go back to the Hebrew, means in dying you will die. And you will die eventually. Just saying die means you'll die immediately. So she actually made it worse, okay, than what, than what, God, had, what God had actually said to her. Now, it is a very dangerous thing to alter God's word. Proverbs 36 says, don't do it. <laughs> if you do this, okay, you're gonna suffer for that. And I think it may have been easier for Satan to deceive her since she now seemed open to changing and altering God's word. He's kind of taken some cues from her. She's changing things, so okay. Now it, we, can, we can change this. We can, we can help her see that, you know, Satan's wanting her to see that he's right and that God is wrong. And you know, Satan, like I said, still works like this today. He wants us to question God's word. Did God really say? But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That's what Paul warns us. You know what? Satan hasn't changed. Satan is still working like this to say today. How did Satan deceive Eve? He made her question God's word. He was subtle. 
he was very subtle. He came in disguise. He turned something that was very good, the desire to be wise, into something very bad. You know, the desire to be wise is not a bad thing, right? It's the one thing Solomon asked for. But when that desire is placed in direct opposition to God's word, he told them not to eat from the tree, then it's not of Christ. Then that's not something we should do. It's of Satan. It's of the world. So... What happened here? What did the serpent say? Well, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan blatantly lies. Now, he does say surely die. At least he gets that part right. But he says you will not surely die. He wants her to doubt God's word and his love for her. Um, You can be like God. You don't need God's love. You don't need his leadership. You can be just like him. And he's implying, you know, you're really missing something if you don't do this. He's telling her that she's lacking wisdom. And when she obtains it, you're going to be like God. You're going to be happy. You're going to be perfect. Everything's going to be great. But happiness and perfection in her own eyes or in Satan's eyes, not in God's eyes. Because he's telling her God's words are lies. They're not true. So why would you want to seek perfection in his eyes? I mean, you can be like him. You don't need him. And that's really been Satan mantra throughout time, especially as it concerns women, right? And you probably all know what I'm talking about here. What is the forbidden fruit that promises perfection today? Boy, the list could go on and on and on, okay? Yes, you can. It's that simple. Now, notice the fine print, which you can't read. It says results not typical. Um, Yeah, you can lose a lot of weight, okay? That's the key. You gotta be skinny. Well, you gotta wear this makeup. You know, if you wear this makeup, you're gonna look great. Everybody's gonna like you. You gotta have your hair, like the most famous, you know, celebrity that's out there. You gotta wear the right clothes. You know, if you do that, that's gonna bring you perfection in the eyes of the world, and that's what's really important. If you get a degree, I mean, you've gotta have an education. You've gotta have a career. You've gotta be a working mom. You've gotta be the perfect wife. You've gotta be the perfect mother. I mean, that's what we hear, right? We are constantly bombarded by these types of books, by TV shows that help us, you know, how to do it all and still, you know, and still survive and still, you know, have some time for ourselves. You know, how to do all these things. We're going to be happy and perfect if we do that. But you know what? Nancy Namas says this, listening to things that are not true is the first step toward ultimate bondage and death. There are no harmless lies. We cannot expose ourselves to the world's false, deceptive way of thinking and come out unscathed. Eve's first mistake was not eating the fruit. Her first mistake was listening to the serpent. Now, it's not that that was sin. It wasn't. But it was a step towards sin because she listened to him and decided that his words were better than God's words. And, you know, the forbidden fruit disappoints us today just like a disappointing Eve. We can never be perfect in the world's eyes. No matter what you do, there will always be something next season that you need to do now um, to, do, to be that, that, perf- that perfect. It doesn't lead to true happiness and perfection that we can only find in God. And I actually think about this a lot because I want to show you a picture of my daughter here. Um, she is gorgeous. <laughs> um, she's five and uh, five and a half now, and she's very, very beautiful on the outside. And a lot of people acknowledge that to her on a constant basis. Um, and, and I realize that. Uh, I have a feeling I'm going to be beating the boys away with a stick, so to speak, at some point here. Um, but what I want to cultivate in her is beauty on the inside. And that's what we talk about a lot. When we watch shows on TV, you know, and they talk about somebody being really pretty, I said, but Elizabeth, is that what's important? And she says, no, it's what's on the inside, Mommy. And I said, exactly. That's what matters to God. First Samuel 16, 7 says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him, but the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Again, he didn't give us a description of Eve for a reason, because what mattered was on the inside, not what was on the outside. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. What's on the inside, where our heart is? So, not the world's standards, okay, but God's standards. That's the standards we need to be living up to. Those are the ones we need to pursue. Those will lead us to happiness. It won't lead us to perfection, not in this life, but it will lead us to much more happiness as a result of that. But what did Eve choose? Did she choose perfection in her eyes, or did she choose perfection in God's eyes? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And she ate from the tree. 
She was very much what we call an evidentialist. She decided that she should use her own mind and her own senses to judge God's word instead of using God's word as the ultimate standard. It wasn't the ultimate standard for her. She was. She decided what was best. And you know, the thing, these things in and of themselves aren't bad. It's not bad to eat good things. It's not bad to look at good things. And it's not bad to become wise. But it can be bad when we give them priority and authority over God's words. By eating the fruit, she blatantly rejected God's word. She said, no, I know better than God. She was obtaining perfection according to her, not according to God. And uh, Matthew Henry says this, our first parents who knew so much did not know this that they knew enough. They knew enough. They didn't need to know anymore, but they didn't think that was right. And some people say to me, you know, but God tempted them, right? I mean, why did he put the tree in the garden in the first place if, you know, if that was going to be the result? I mean, he, he was really tempting them by doing this. But what does scripture say about that? Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. She desired to be perfect in her own eyes rather than God's. And thus she was tempted by what she perceived was the good-looking, good-tasting food that would make her perfect. So it was her fault not God. God does not tempt. She was enticed by her own desires. So she ate from the tree, and then what happened next? Um, she gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, it appears that Adam was nearby. It doesn't appear she had to go and really look for him. We don't know that for a fact, but it doesn't appear that he was very far away. Now, I doubt he heard the conversation between her and the serpent. Um, I would assume that he would have intervened had he heard that, but nonetheless, um, she doesn't seem like she had to do very much here. She gave it to him, and he ate. So not only did she sin, but she also participated in leading Adam to sin. Now, he's still guilty. It was his choice. He chose to do it. But nonetheless, she had a role in it. And something for us today from that, you know, Nancy Namas says, is my life setting a godly example to my husband, children, and friends? Or by my words and example, do I ever encourage others to act in a way that is contrary to the word of God? We definitely don't want to leave this legacy of Eve because not only did she sin, but she participated in her husband's sinning as well. And we don't want to have any role in that, in our husband's sinning, our children's sinning. We don't want to do that. We want to encourage others by our actions and words to obey God's word. And something else we need to talk about here. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now that's in 1 Timothy. So again, you kind of find out bits and pieces about what happened there all throughout scripture. You know, Adam was not deceived, indicating that he knew full well that he was disobeying God. He knew there would be punishment. He wasn't deceived. Um, now, we don't, why did he eat? And why did he choose to go ahead and eat? Well, maybe because of his love for his wife and he didn't want her to die alone, which sounds really noble, but our greatest love should be for God and his words, not for another person. And so not only did Adam shirk his responsibility as leader, he followed her leading instead of being the leader, but he was, but he was not deceived. He knew he was disobeying, he knew there would be punishment, and he did it anyways, whereas Eve actually was deceived. She believed Satan's lies and she believed there wouldn't be punishment or that that might not occur. Now keep that thought in mind, okay? There is a difference. Adam was not deceived, Eve was. And we're gonna talk about that later. So what's the result of this? And the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. So instead of happiness and perfection, what did they get? Shame, disgust, and distress. They got nothing. They didn't get happiness. They didn't get perfection. They didn't get anything that Satan was promising. They got the exact opposite. And they tried to cover their sins. You know, they not only made fig leaves, they hid in the shrubbery, right? They knew what they had done was wrong at that point, and they wanted to hide from that. But no human action can save us from our sins because we're all sinners. We need something sinless. And Philip Yancey says it this way, by their choice, they put distance between themselves and God. Before they had walked and talked with God, and now when they heard his approach, they hid in the shrubbery. An awkward separation had crept in to spoil the intimacy, and every quiver of disappointment in our own relationship with God 
and an aftershock from their initial act of rebellion. I mean, how many times do we find ourselves doing things that we know we shouldn't be doing? And the reason for that, the reason we're all sinners and that we all do that is because we're all descended from Adam and Eve. And because this is a choice they made, they made that choice for all of us. And, um, and we have to deal with that every day in our relationship with God as well. Well, even though God obviously knows that what they did, he's gonna next question them about it because he wants them to confess. He wants them to acknowledge that what they did was wrong. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Okay, so we get the famous game of pass the buck. <laughs> not my fault, you know, it's somebody else's. So it's interesting here too, Adam not only blames the woman, but he blames God, right? He says, the woman you gave to be with me, she is the problem, um, and, so, and he's blaming her too. But again, what is he doing here? Shirking his responsibility as a leader. As the leader of, family, of the family, it was his responsibility to obey God's word first and foremost, and he did not. And it's interesting here. Notice who God questions first. Eve was the first one to eat, but who did God question first? Adam. Why? Because Adam is the leader. And so he goes to him first and talks to him, and then he's going to talk to Eve. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Okay. Um, so again, she's blaming someone else. It's the serpent's fault. So they've confessed, more or less, um, to what they've done, even though they've sort of passed the blame on to others. But What's so amazing about this next verse, about Genesis 3.15, before God tells them, okay, this is the consequences of your disobedience, this is the curse that's gonna be pronounced on you, he tells them of his way, the, the way that he is going to redeem all of mankind. He doesn't actually punish first, he redeems first, which is really interesting. They deserved death on the spot. That's what they deserve, but, and we all do, but they were given life instead. What a gracious, loving, and compassionate God we serve. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I have with my own child many times, and maybe I need to change this, and I, I'm really kind of convicted about this, you know, I punish first. <laughs> go sit, go, you know, go in time out, whatever, and then we'll talk about it. You know, we talk about redemption, but what did God do first? Redemption and then punishment. So I think I need to rethink that. I'm giving a talk next year on parenting, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> by that time, um, if I've changed my ways on that, if I think that may be how I need to be doing things. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This has become one of my favorite passages, passages in all of scripture because God presents the solution to the problem of sin for all mankind for all time. The Redeemer will pay the price for all sins, for all men, for all time. He's gonna take away the sin. He's not just gonna cover them up. He's gonna take them away because he is sinless. He is God's son. He is the ultimate sacrifice and the only one that can do that. So there is love, hope, mercy, and compassion in the midst of wrath, cursing, and misery. The most horrible thing that could ever happen just happened, and yet God tells of the most wonderful thing that could ever happen is going to happen in the future. I mean, you see just this real this big dichotomy there. You know, so Eve has two legacies. She has one of sin and death, no doubt about it, and that's what a lot of people focus on, but she also has one of salvation and life. There would be perpetual enmity between Eve's descendants, the human race, and Satan, and eventually her seed would crush Satan's head. What good news, that Jesus Christ would eventually be born and crush Satan's head. Satan would not reign forever. The curse would not be forever. Even though what they had done was terrible, it wasn't gonna be forever. Now, it's interesting here too. Notice how God focuses on her seed when referring to the solution to the problem of sin. It's her seed, even though it's gonna come from Adam and Eve's descendants, it's gonna come from them both. He focuses on her for the solution to the problem. But when we talk about the problem itself, it's always referred back to the one man, to Adam. And when referring to the problem, anytime you see sin and death and suffering, um, when they talk about that in reference to Genesis, it's always in reference to Adam. That's what scripture makes clear. Now, how many times have you heard, 
well, we wouldn't be in this mess if it weren't for the woman's fault, you know? Huh? I mean, right, a lot of people have heard that, right? It was all Eve's fault. It was all the woman's fault. But what does Scripture say? For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Now, that's interesting. Eve was the first to sin, yet Adam is the one that sin is attributed to. Now, remember we talked earlier, Adam was not deceived. He knew full well what he was doing when he did that. So Adam is held responsible for sin and death because not only did he shirk his responsibility as leader, he was not deceived. Not that Eve wasn't guilty. She absolutely was. She was culpable. She was responsible. But because she was under Adam's leadership, he is the one held accountable. So again, this confirms the roles of helper, of leader and helper. So after the promise to redeem all of mankind, okay, so he said this is going to be the redemption, God tells tells them of the consequences, though. They still have to deal with the consequences of what's happened. So he curses, curses the serpent and all of creation, and then he curses Eve and then Adam. So he does start the cursing with, well, the first serpent first and foremost, but then Eve. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. So she was cursed in the two relationships that she was designed to draw the most um, pleasure from, her husband and her children. And she's being cursed in those too. And we're still cursed in those relationships today. Think about what most books, magazines, TV talk shows, all of those things, whether Christian or non-Christian, focus on for women, marriage and family, uh, marriage and kids, right? Bar none, that's what you hear. Because that's where the biggest problem lies, because we've been cursed in that way. And we're gonna focus on the second half of this curse first. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. What does that mean? You know, that has this, the same Hebrew word for desire there is also used in Genesis 4, 7. It has the same language and the same grammatical construction. After Cain killed Abel, God says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And it's a desire it's for you, but you should rule over it. Desire here means that sin wants to rule over you and master you, but you have to master sin. That's what he's telling King. So how does it apply here? So in this context, desire means that Eve would want to rule over or master her husband, which is against God's original design of the wife's role as helpmate and the husband's role as leader. So again, it's confirming those leader-helper roles in marriage. The curse would be absolutely meaningless if God decided they both should be leader or if you know Eve was the leader, right? The curse wouldn't mean anything. What would we be cursed in? So it makes it very clear. Adam was the leader, Eve was the helper. I mean, that, that's really what it's emphasizing to us. Now, what would Adam's reaction to that be? And he shall rule over you. Adam would be strict and domineering in his leadership of her, which again is against God's original design of him to be a loving leader and her to have loving submission as the helper. It's going against that. She wants to rule over him, so he reacts to that. He doesn't like that, and, you know, and he has a problem with that, and he reacts to it. So, and, and, you know, think about your marriage today. What do you struggle with the most? I struggle with this the most. It's, you know, I have a very strong personality <laughs> and I'm very outspoken. And so that's hard for me. I really do struggle with that. Um, part of it's personality. Part of it is just because this is part of the curse. And then we have to really think about that because, you know, when we have the problems we do with in marriage, I think a lot of it comes from the fact that um, men are not being the leaders they should be and women aren't being the helpers they should be. And that's, that's, that's the really the problem, I think, a lot of time. But again, grace is shown in the midst of cursing, right? You could still be in a marital relationship with Adam. And obviously, we still draw a lot of pleasure from our relationships with our husbands. I mean, we can still do that. So again, grace is shown there. Now, I also said to the woman, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Now, I've never been pregnant. Um, we adopted our daughter from China. But I've seen what other women have had to endure. So I'm well-versed um, in the pains of pregnancy um, and, and giving birth, but even though it's now cursed and painful, again, grace was shown in the midst of cursing. She could bear children, and eventually she would bring the seed, Jesus Christ, to crush Satan's head. 
And I love the way that John MacArthur says this. As a matter of fact, the promise that Eve would still bear children mitigated every other aspect of the curse. That one simple expectation contained a ray of hope for the whole human race. Eve had set a whole world of evil in motion by her disobedience. Now, through her offspring, she would produce a savior. Not only should she institute the problem, but she's also going to institute the, the salvation up from that problem. So again, grace amidst the suffering. So now that the curses have been pronounced on Adam and Eve, um, it's interesting because Adam now names his wife. Now, I, I just call them Adam and Eve all throughout here because that's what most people are familiar with, but she's really not Eve up until now. She's just woman. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Eve actually means life giver. And many times throughout scripture, God renames people to signify a new beginning. And here Adam renames, um, renames her um, as Eve, and eventually, and it's a new beginning for them. Even though things are horrible now, it's a new beginning, because eventually through Eve's descendants would come the promised seed. That seed would come and crush Satan. So just as Eve was a physical life giver, someday Christ would, be a, would come to be a spiritual life giver. So, and again, too, because she's the mother of all the living, right? We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. Everyone in this room is biologically related to everyone else. <laughs> it may be really distant, but we're all related because we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. And because of that, we are also all sinners in need of Christ's redemption. Now, I was really impressed as I was preparing this that I needed to give you sort of a modern day example that God chose his grace, admits the suffering that we go through in life and even the bad choices sometimes that we make. And the best way I know to do that is talk a little bit about my family. Um, this is a picture um, when my husband and I were in China back in 2005, and we had just received our daughter, Elizabeth. Because that's the best example I can think of. Um, my husband and I were diagnosed with infertility um, several years ago, and we know that's because of the curse. Uh, we, we know the reason for it, so to speak, but that doesn't necessarily make it any easier to deal with. It does in some ways, but it's still painful, it's sad, and it's difficult to accept. But God brought Elizabeth into our lives through adoption. He knew that she was going to need a mom and dad. And he knew that we needed a daughter to take care of. And so he brought us together. Elizabeth is a living, breathing example of the grace of God um, that is shown in suffering. And she's going to be here on Thursday. So if you want to see her, <laughs> she'll be here Thursday night. You can tell her how cute she is. Um, and so it's not just for Adam and Eve. You know, it's not just for people in the Bible. It's for us, it's true for us today. We need to remember that God's grace is there even when we're suffering, even when we're going through hard times. Well, we go forward to Genesis 4 now and we see that Eve has given birth. Now Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again this time his brother Abel. Imagine how thrilled she was with Cain's birth. Again, God was showing his grace and compassion and kindness and forgiveness by allowing her to still have children. Now some commentators think that her wording here indicates she thought this would be the seed that would crush Satan's head. She thought it would be an immediate thing that would happen. She was going to be sorely disappointed. Okay? Cain was not going to be the seed. Um, in fact, he would commit the first murder recorded in Scripture. But what does this show us about Eve? She was trusting God's word. Hey, she's changed, right? She's trusting it now. God's gonna send the seed and he's gonna crush Satan. And so she's very, I think she's a changed woman as a result of this. And I'm sure though that Adam and Eve now saw very clearly what their sin had brought um, for the future generations because um, they were deprived of both sons in one day. Um, Cain killed Abel and then Cain moved away as a result of that. But again, grace is shown in the midst of her pain and suffering. And Adam knew his wife again and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel whom Cain killed. And Seth literally means substitution or settled or appointed one. Again, maybe she's thinking about the promised seed that would crush Satan's head. Now it wouldn't be an immediate, that immediate seed that would do that. But it would be through Seth's line. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. You know, Seth had been brought up by godly parents. That much we can ascertain because he taught his children about God and his words and they were true. They didn't have the Bible um, at that time like we have today. They didn't have the advantage of that, but they had a relationship with God and they knew what God's commands were. They knew what he wanted them to do. So the legacy was really important because it was through Seth, through that line, that Jesus Christ would be born. This godly line which endures in the faith of millions even today was to a large degree their legacy. Happily for Eve, it will eventually prove to be an infinitely more enduring legacy 
than her sin. After all, heaven will be filled with her redeemed offspring, and they will be eternally occupied with the celebration of the work of her seed, of Jesus Christ. So we come to the close of corruption now, and um, eventually Adam and Eve died. Adam lived to be 930 years old. We don't know how long Eve lived, but he lived a, a very long life, and through their line of Seth, Jesus Christ would come. So Next, we have to go to this, the, th the third sea because Adam and Eve have now died and we're on to catastrophe. And the curse we see has really devastating effects. But scripture tells us that man's thoughts were evil continually. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like today. <laughs> um, it's hard to think how things could get much worse than they are, but it's possible they were actually worse back then. Uh, I think we're headed that way, but we're maybe not there yet. So what did God do? God judged man and all creation with a global catastrophic flood. But he saved Noah and his sons and their wives aboard the ark. They were descendants of Adam and Eve. They survived, so the promise of Genesis 3.15, 3.15 would be fulfilled. The seed still had to come. It had not come yet. So we had to save some of humanity in order to be able to do that. And then we go to confusion about 150 years later. No surprise, man still isn't obeying God. Um, God. After the flood, God wanted them to multiply and fill the earth. What did they do? Multiplied and stayed in one place. Okay? And they built the Tower of Babel. And so God judged that again. And people migrated. Okay, They finally filled the earth. And through the people at the Tower of Babel, who again were the descendants of Adam and Eve, the promise of Genesis 3.15 would be fulfilled. And so we're going to fast forward now to the New Testament, okay, because then we're just getting descendants after, you know, descendants after descendants, getting lots of people here, and we come to Christ. We come to the birth of Christ, and we see through his genealogy that Christ comes from the line of Seth. Um, through Adam and Eve, through Seth. How Eve must have rejoiced at the birth of the Savior. Finally, the seed had come after this long time through the godly line of Seth. The creator had finally stepped into his creation to do something about what happened back in the Garden of Eden. And that's why the gospel message is so intricately linked to the historicity of Genesis, that it is true. Because if it's not, then it totally annihilates the reason for Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so important. So the promise is gonna be fulfilled soon. It hasn't happened quite yet, but it will be. And with the cross, that promise is finally fulfilled. And as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is is the devil, that Jesus Christ would come and crush Satan's head, finally, by resurrecting from the dead. And because he overcame death, we can overcome death as well. And you know what? That promise that has, that promise of Genesis 3.15 really has its final fulfillment when Satan and the curse have been destroyed forever, okay? That, that's when it's going to reach the final fulfillment. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and the servants will serve him. I'm looking forward to that day. Uh, I know we're all looking forward to that day. Well, there's not going to be any more crying. There's not going to be any more tears, no more pain. None of these things that we have to deal with today, it's all going to be gone. So Eve had two legacies. She had one of sin and despair, definitely, but she also had one of salvation hope, which, as we've said, will ultimately be the more enduring legacy. The question is, what legacy are we going to leave? Will we choose to be like Eve and not obey God's word and seek perfection in the eyes of the world, which is so easy to do. It's, it's so easy to be enticed by that. Um, but the problem is that is it leads to sin and despair. Or are we going to choose to be like Eve and offer salvation and hope in Jesus Christ to the world by obeying God's word and tr instructing our children? I don't care if they're biological or spiritual children from God's word. Are we going to instruct them and raise up a generation that leads to salvation and hope? I pray that you will choose to leave that legacy of salvation and hope. Now, how can you accomplish that? We need to be educated about what God's word says. We need to renew our passion for the Bible and stand on the authority of God's word because we live in a world that shuns it. And I wanna share with you a quote that I think really summarizes well why I think being educated about God and his word is so difficult 
for women and so challenging for women. And this has been further confirmed by women that I've talked to um, this week at the conference. Um, you know, it's just amazing to me that a lot of women feel this way. And it's kind of a long quote, but bear with me because I think it's so important. And this is a quote by Nancy Dimash. She says this, it distresses me to see how many church services and Christian gatherings today give a small place to the word of God, if at all. I remember attending a women's conference some years ago. A lot of women there, a lot of interesting speakers, a lot of spellbinding stories, things that made you cry, things that made you laugh. But what struck me at the end of the day was that you could have gone through the whole conference and never needed your Bible. This was a Christian conference. The power is in the Word of God. Otherwise, it's just my story. It's just my thoughts. The power is in the Word of God. The Word of God should be the centerpiece of our public life, of our community of faith. But where is the central place given to the Word of God? There's no substitute for the Word of God. You can bring illustrations out all day long of modern day culture, out of modern day readings and writings and illustrations. But the scripture cannot be an add-on. It cannot be eclipsed in our services by music, by drama, by speaking about the Word of God. We need to be making the Word of God central. And I just, I love that because it's so true. And I, I can't tell you the number of women I've already talked to here that said, you know, I basically don't go to women's conferences anymore because they're just fluffy. <laughs> and that's what I call them. They're fluffy, um, you know. And, and, I, and, you know, I traditionally have had a very difficult time getting in to a lot of women's groups because, unfortunately, they, they just, they want the, many times, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of times they want fluff. They, they just, they've never been fed the meat. They don't even know what it is. They keep being fed milk and they want to have tea time. And that's not, we need to get out of that, okay? We've got to learn this. We've got to defend God's word. We've got to raise our children that way because God's word is no longer our foundation and focus. It really isn't in this society. Man's opinions, man's idea reigns supreme. And that's why we focus on Genesis so much because Genesis is absolutely foundational to all Christian doctrines, to the sciences, to marriage, to manhood, to womanhood, to parenting, all of those things. And yet it's the most hotly debated book in all of scripture. And because it's doubted, the authority of all of God's word is in question as a result of that. And a lot of these symptoms that we see, things like homosexual behavior, family breakup, abortion, pornography, are a result of that. That's why, that's why people are doing these things. And if we don't do something about it, we are gonna end up leaving Eve's legacy of sin and despair. And so we have to uphold the authority of God's word from the very first birth. And when we do that, those symptoms are gonna start disappearing. We're not gonna need talk shows and books on them, okay? Um, because they're gonna, those types of things are gonna decrease or go away. And it's so important, you know, by becoming a mother, okay, it has really changed my outlook on life completely. And those of you that are mothers know that. And uh, my daughter looked at me the other night, and she said this several times, but she said it again the other night. She said, Mommy, the Bible is the best book in the whole world. And I said, Amen. <laughs> and then she looked at me one other, she looked at me, um, and another time she said to me, she said, and I put these down because it's so important, we need to listen to God, Jesus, and the Bible and not to the devil. And she's right. I think that deserves another amen. Um, and, you know, the legacy has continued um, that my mother gave me, that her mother gave her, and I can continue that legacy with my own daughter. And I encourage you to do that. Even if you haven't grown up in a Christian home, you need to start that legacy. And it needs to be purposeful, okay? This isn't something that just happens by sending your kids to church or sending them to a Christian school or even homeschooling, whatever you do. It must be purposeful. 